Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a second. I know we have a number of people that have registered who are in the process of logging on now, so bear with us for a moment. Okay, let's go ahead and get started this morning and welcome. Uh, this is the service provider training, not the provide, but the provider training workshop, uh, part two of a series this week in partnership with the Lower Rio Grande Valley Development Council. Uh, my name is Dub Taylor and I'll be making the, the uh, most of the presentation today, but we're gonna get started first with a, a few other items. Uh, today, we're gonna jump into the nuts and bolts of how to put a PACE project together. On Tuesday, we had an overview of PACE, the PACE program generally, uh, how it works, and, uh, and, and how it's uh, an, uh, a very useful, applicable tool in the tool chest uh, for projects in the Lower Rugan Valley. So uh, both of these recordings uh, will, be, will be available later, as will the slide decks. Uh, so if you're taking notes, you can please, you can do that, you can continue to do that whatever works best for you, but we'll also provide these slides later as a, as a point of reference and a resource. So uh, you don't need to uh, write down notes feverishly. You can spend more time listening and, and uh, this will be provided later. Before we get started with the training component, I'd like to first uh, introduce our key partner in the Valley, uh, Rick Carrera, uh, the Director of Economic Development with the Lower Rio Grande Valley Development Council. And uh, Rick, I'm gonna pull a slide up for you. And if you wanna make a few opening comments, that'd be terrific. Oh, great, thanks, Deb. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm uh, Rick Carrera, I'm with the Lower Rugan Lower Rugan Valley Development Council, the Director of Community and Economic Development. Uh, my, my help, myself, and uh, my staff, uh, very good, very good and hardworking staff, we put together and managed several programs that promote economic and community development in the area. And I realize this is more on the tech, this present, today's presentation is more on the technical side. So I won't really go into a ton of detail on all the services we provide other than the fact that I, I asked um, Deb and Charlene to keep this slide in here for reference. I know there might be some people who are, who work in economic development circles on this uh, call. I wanted one and I wanted to have this information there for their reference in case they needed to ask us any questions. We are the economic development district here in the, in the lower Rugan Valley. If there's an EDA, uh, which is the economic development administration, if there's an EDA funded project that you are considered for considering pursuing, by all means, we are your, for your resource for that project. Among some others, we have several projects here that deal with solid waste. Uh, we do have the annual road to recycling tire collection event that happens every year, which we are starting to work on already now. And then of course we do a host of other activities related to community development, water quality, and, and also some regional tourism uh, so initiatives. One of which is the, uh, there's an app and a website called Explore RGV, which we work hard to utilize to promote regional tourism. I encourage everybody on this call to go find that app and website and go like those follows on Facebook. Uh, we will have start having some giveaways on that app for those who like the actual application. And it's also a very good resource for things going on in the area, activities, events, all that kind of good stuff. Um, another program that we support very heavily here within the Lower Oregon Valley Depart Development Council is the PACE program. I didn't include that as a bullet here on the uh, slide because this is, that's the meat of today's uh, presentation. And with that, Deb, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Rick. But. So moving on. Um, again, my name is Dub Taylor. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Texas Pace Authority. Uh, been with the organization for just about a year. Uh, before that, served uh, uh, over two decades as the Director of the State Energy Conservation Office, where we did similar uh, work to Pace, but exclusively in the public sector. So schools, local governments, uh, public universities. Uh, technical engineering work, as well as project financing, and a lot of projects in the Valley. So quite familiar with the process and with the opportunity and, and with the territory as well. 
And then prior to that, I was in the uh, private sector and uh, uh, commercial real estate, property appraisal and property management experience. So uh, Pace ties all those things together and I'm pleased to be with the organization and, and happy to be your presenter today. So what is Texas Pace Authority? Uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we were created uh, exclusively to operate PACE programs for local governments across the state of Texas. When the legislature passed the enabling PACE law uh, back uh, seven, eight years ago, it, it gave the opportunity for local governments to create PACE programs and offer uh, this type of financing to property owners within their jurisdictions. But most local governments immediately looked at it and said, well, uh, we would probably need to create a, a new department or at least bring in some specialists to operate this for us. And so that was a challenge. And so into that void, the Texas Pace Authority was created. Uh, we work for local governments. Uh, we work uh, both for cities, counties, uh, as well as council of governments, uh, as we do in partnership in the, in the Lower River Grand Valley with, with Rick's organization. We work with property owners to help them identify uh, uh, projects that may qualify for PACE and walk them through the process. The capital providers that provide the financing for these projects, uh, we work with them as well, again, in a supporting role. Uh, our organization does not provide any financing or any funding directly. Uh, we, we simply are, are the administrator, the conduit uh, to help facilitate these projects. And then with service providers like yourselves today, many of you, uh, we help uh, support uh, you in understanding how this process works so that uh, you can, you can uh, uh, offer this financing tool as a way to achieve more comprehensive projects uh, and support your customers. And again, we don't provide any direct services on implementation of the projects. So that is the role. So we help tie it all together, uh, but we do not have a, a direct or active role in the projects themselves. So that's, that's our role as the administrator. So today, our agenda, we're going to cover uh, these different areas uh, in, uh, in the hour that we have uh, allocated. Uh, it's uh, going to be fairly quick, and this is a pretty deep dive. <clears throat> so certainly afterwards, if there are questions or you need clarification on anything, we're happy to, to take those. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A answering at the end. Uh, you can uh, use the chat box. Uh, on, on the uh, screen or preferably the question and answer. And we'll take a look at those uh, at the end and get all of those answered. And then if there's anything else we need to follow up with afterwards individually offline, we're happy to do that as well. So today uh, covering, we're gonna look at, at how to uh, leverage uh, comprehensive projects utilizing PACE. We're gonna look at the process flow, both for financing and the construction process. We're going to look at the supporting technical report. Uh, these are all based on energy and water savings. So there's a, a technical basis for the projects. The uh, due diligence component, the third party review, and then also follow on resources that you can use as you're moving forward with this. So that's our agenda for today. So let's jump into the, the first topic. Uh, and a little bit of a review, this was covered Tuesday if you were on the webinar, but a reminder, what is PACE? Well, it stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. And then the part that's not part of the acronym is financing. And that's really what it is. And it's a simple way of paying for capital projects with no money out of pocket. Can provide 100% financing for energy, water, conservation, or distributed generation projects. Uh, it can be cash flow positive day one. And eligibility in Texas uh, for PACE is commercial uh, properties. These can include nonprofits, uh, houses of worship. We've had some PACE projects in, in those, uh, industrial and manufacturing, and multifamily, assuming it's five units or more. So anything uh, four units or less is considered uh, single family residential and not eligible, but, but certainly uh, everything uh, be other than that would be eligible. And the key to this all is it is repaid via a special property assessment that is on the property for the useful life of the improvements. So that provides the security for the lender uh, to offer longer term financing that otherwise would not be available. It was authorized in statute, uh, the local government code. It is voluntary, meaning that local governments can decide if this makes sense for them to offer and, and many have. Uh, 
uh, 55 different uh, cities, counties, and regions around the state. Open market, meaning that any contractor uh, can do the work. Any capital provider uh, that you know obviously can can meet certain financing requirements can provide the capital. Uh, any owner, uh, any property owner, can take advantage of this. So uh, there's not a prescribed list of, of of vendors or contractors or capital providers. Uh, it's open. And again, uh, local governments take the action to create the program, and then our organization is in the, the role of administering this on their behalf. So why Texas pays and why does this make sense? Well, it's a, again, a means of improving these assets, these, these commercial real estate uh, assets, uh, buildings, uh, manufacturing facilities in a way that's budget neutral and cash flow positive. That's really key. Uh, many of these projects uh, remain uh, undone because there's not adequate capital available or uh, you're upside down if you uh, pursue uh, conventional equipment financing. It lowers utility operating costs uh, and increases your net operating income. So if you look at the two models, the conventional financing, the scenario on the left, uh, say your building has uh, aging or failing uh, HVAC equipment, lighting, uh, manufacturing systems, uh, things that, that are not performing well. And you know that, that by replacing that equipment, you could do better but you don't have the, the budget, or maybe you do have the budget, but it's allocated for other priorities, then you would knock on your, your banks or a, a conventional equipment financing uh, provider's door, and they would say, sure, we can provide you the financing, and our terms are uh, maximum 60 months, maybe five years, and interest rate today, say five, five and a half percent. Well, okay, that gets your project completed, but your repayment during that uh, repayment term is going to be greater than the savings that you realize from the project. So you're upside down financially, and that's represented on this left side. Uh, with PACE, you really take that payments repayment uh, component and you knock that over, and you better align that with the benefits from the project over time. And so that means that your cash flow positive day one, and this is uh, facilitated through the assessment mechanism that otherwise would not be available through conventional equipment financing. So that's the key, long-term financing so that the benefits uh, are, are equal to or exceed the costs over that term. So that's, that's PACE in a nutshell. The types of improvements we're talking about, it's, very, uh, it's a very general list in uh, the enabling laws. Uh, it, it essentially says projects that reduce energy or water usage or generate energy on site. And some examples of those types of projects are listed here. In the energy column, what you see are high efficiency chillers and boilers, mechanical systems, uh, controls, uh, combustion, renewable uh, energy uh, systems on the customer side of the meter. Uh, all of this, I should say, it's important to note uh, has to be on your side of the meter, the electric meter, the water meter, the gas meter. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, if, if your idea is I want to build a large uh, solar project, uh, solar farm, and uh, sell the power to the utility and use PACE financing, that would not be eligible, uh, most likely. So these are improvements on your side of the, of the meter to reduce your operating costs. On the water side, also important is um, things that uh, could be wastewater recovery, could be fixtures, a number of different things there, irrigation equipment, uh, pumps, motors, compressed air systems. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty long list of things that could be eligible. So key to qualifying a project for PACE is meeting uh, at a, a savings to investment ratio or SIR. And so the way this is calculated <clears throat> is the savings component we look at the total projected energy, water, and operational savings over the life of the project. Now, the energy and water savings is, is pretty straightforward. That would be <clears throat> the avoided uh, units of consumption uh, based on uh, historic utility usage. Uh, the operational savings is something that can be added or can be considered too, but it can be a little trickier to calculate. And the, the type of things we're talking about there are <clears throat> For example, if you have a, an older uh, HVAC system that requires uh, regular uh, service and maintenance to keep it operational, and you have a contract uh, with a service provider 
uh, to keep that equipment running. Well, by replacing the equipment, you now have you now you now obviate the need for that service contract, and so that becomes an avoided cost that can be that can be considered in the savings component. So when we talk about operational, if it is a an established definable operational savings that goes away as a result of the project, then that can be counted as well. On the investment side, we're looking at the total amount of the assessment, and this is uh, the net financing amount. So what we would hope is that these projects really by their nature are going to qualify for some uh, level of incentive, uh, probably from a, from a local utility, uh, electric utility, uh, co-op, uh, water system, uh, municipal utility. So those incentives should be pursued and built into, uh, in, into the cost model for the project. So that's like a cash contribution. So the investments, the, the total amount of the assessment, the net financing amount, and then the calculation is very straightforward. If you look at the bottom, it's basically the savings divided by the investment. And uh, the example here, if you have a project that ties together an HVAC replacement, lighting, controls, and then uh, maybe you, you add rooftop PV, the total cost of the project's a million dollars, and that's all costs. So that includes the cost of the financing, as well as soft costs, transaction costs in the front end. And the savings projected over that 20-year period, the 20-year financing term, because that's the average uh, estimated useful life of the equipment, uh, is a million five, then the SIR is 1.5. And to qualify, uh, in Texas, uh, the SAR has to be one or greater. So that's key, that's a key qualifier to keep in mind. So that's the SAR, which is important to remember. And again, uh, things like if you were needing to do just an HVAC project, uh, you might not meet that SIR with that project on its own. But if you bundle in lighting, controls, uh, water fixtures, other things, then that can help generate more savings and bring the SIR uh, down to one or, or greater than one and, uh, and, and make the project call. Bundling and, and approaching the needs of a facility in a comprehensive fashion is really important. If you look at how this uh, kind of works out uh, in a table format, and this comes out of, a, uh, out of our uh, technical assessment report uh, format, uh, you look at how these projects stack up. So on the far left side, uh, you have ECM and WCM one and two, as you can see, that stands for energy conservation measure or water conservation measure. So the description, the cost, the useful life, the projected savings uh, as that moves over to the right. And so the cost column, that's the sum of all those things. And then the savings is the sum of all those things. Uh, we look at, again, the, the, the weighted useful life. And as you can see, you know, a longer uh, payback item can be leveraged by a quicker payback item, and then the facility can be addressed in a comprehensive fashion, uh, really uh, addressing the needs versus just kind of a one-by-one -one, uh, approach, and PACE financing allows you to do this. So a couple of real examples, and uh, we also, <clears throat> the Texas PACE Authority, we operate the PACE program in El Paso County, and so uh, another uh, border region and uh, these are a couple of projects there that illustrate how this comprehensive approach ties it all together. This is a historic property, a building in downtown El Paso, and there the, the building is being totally renovated, needed everything. If you look at these measures one by one, an elevator motor and control replacement would not qualify for PACE on its own. Uh, it would not meet the SIR. The building envelope, uh, the windows, uh, same thing there. But if you tie all these together because the building needed new HVAC and lighting, elevator motors and controls, uh, building envelope improvements and plumbing fixtures, okay, now it does. And uh, there, they were also to able to, to bring in uh, incentives in the form of historic tax credits, which, which helps buy down the cost of the project. And so this one qualified. So this is an example of how uh, a comprehensive approach can be taken. Another illustration, and uh, this is, uh, uh, if you look at the measure box in the middle, again, this, this really ties together the HVC, lighting, uh, energy management system, and water. This also is interesting because uh, the there's a common owner with these properties, Simon, 
properties, uh, they're a, a, a large mall operator, as you may know. Uh, they wanted to do these projects in different jurisdictions, but all under one assessment, all under one loan and one financing arrangement. So uh, because uh, PACE is available statewide, uh, this was a possibility. So if you have a client or you own property, say you have a warehouse or hospital or hotel, lodging, retail in the Valley, and you may have properties elsewhere in the state, you could address all of those at the same time under one financing arrangement. They would be different assessments locally, but one financing package uh, through PACE. So this is a way that Simon did that. <clears throat> so let's look at the process flow on the financing side. Another key uh, criteria for eligibility under PACE, uh, we have uh, underwriting metrics. And so uh, working through these kind of from top to bottom, the assessment to the assessed value ratio uh, currently in our guideline uh, has to be less than 20%. So you don't want to uh, have a, an 80% assessment uh, based on the value. You want to have plenty of header in there. Uh, this is actually in the process of being updated uh, to 25%. Uh, and we look there from the, from, from the assessed value of, of the property as the improved value or stabilized value after the project is completed. Uh, so that is a, a, a key criteria to keep in mind. Again, the savings to investment ratio, which we've already covered, uh, has to be greater than one. And then also, if there is a mortgage uh, on the property, uh, because the PACE uh, assessment becomes senior, the mortgage holder would have to provide uh, consent. Uh, so uh, we've had, uh, I think, probably two thirds of the projects uh, that have been PACE projects in the state so far have required mortgage holder consent. Uh, so that is uh, something to be considered. It is a, a hurdle, uh, not a barrier. And oftentimes we just uh, need to uh, you know, help, help the mortgage holder understand how this works and uh, how it actually uh, increases the value of the asset they hold the primary mortgage on and, uh, and, and can help them long-term. So those are key underwriting metrics. The application process and this uh, sort of spaghetti chart process map really shows the whole process. And I've circled the different sections that are related to the financial aspects. Uh, the first one on the bottom left, uh, there's an underwriting review and, and a pre-approval letter that's required. Uh, if you keep following the arrows down to the, to the middle right, uh, the underwriting review is complete. Uh, moving up, the applicant lender signed the contract with the county and there's a lien recorded. Then the financing closes. Uh, that then uh, provides essentially the, the line of credit or the, or the financing, the construction financing and the project can move forward. And then it moves into uh, construction and completion. So there's a couple of financial uh, stops there in the process flow. And we're gonna go into, and get, go into these a little bit more uh, as, we, as we proceed. So capital providers, I mentioned this, <clears throat> uh, as an open market program, any uh, capital provider, again, that meets sort of certain minimum uh, uh, financial uh, criteria uh, can uh, fund these projects. So uh, on our list currently, and this is not a, a, an exclusive, exclusive list, uh, certainly if you have a, a bank, a capital provider, a local lender that is interested in, in financing a PACE project, uh, they could they could be added to the list. Uh, so this is more informational, but you can see there's a mix. We have uh, some banks, some local banks, uh, some regional banks. We have some PACE uh, specialty capital providers. And if you go to our website here, what you'll see also is that uh, the different uh, types of capital providers, you know, may set different preferred project thresholds. So a bank, uh, you know, may uh, look at projects that are say, you know, $50,000 or $100,000, and they may have an upper limit. And they may also, uh, you know, have sort of a policy, internal policy based approach on on how long they want to offer the financing. Uh, some of the PACE capital specialty providers, capital providers may have a much longer term view, uh, they may have they may uh, uh, entertain a 20 25 year payback project and may go up to 25, 50 million dollars, whatever the project's needs are. So there's an array of capital providers that understand how PACE works that can provide the financing. 
And I should, before moving on to construction, I should also say the capital providers that are on our list uh, are familiar with the process and are uh, terrific partners to sort of provide handholding as they're moving through that spaghetti chart I showed earlier. So moving on to the uh, construction, uh, the, the, the next section, construction. So the, the basic outline here on the construction side <clears throat> involves contractors, uh, the contractor column on the left, and then the ITPR column on the right. And uh, contractors, self-explanatory, uh, ITPR is an acronym that stands for Independent Third Party Reviewer. And this is really the, uh, the control, the due diligence, ensuring that the project is going to perform as expected. Uh, that provides uh, uh, assurance uh, for the owner that uh, you know, they will realize the savings they're expecting. And for the lender, uh, that the project will cash flow and the owner should have uh, sufficient headroom uh, in their budget uh, to make the payments. So that's, that's we're gonna go into the ITPR in a moment, but that's what you'll see ITPR pop up from time to time, and that's what that means. So the process is, it works like this, the contractor, and this can be the owner, it can be a contractor working for the owner, it can be an independent engineer, uh, anyone can conduct the energy and water analysis and, and do that report. There is a format for certain information that has to be in it, uh, but that can be uh, done by, by any, by a number of different parties. Then that moves over to the ITPR for the savings review, uh, again, performing the due diligence. The project moves into construction. And then finally, the ITPR does installation verification. So we'll, we'll go into, into these steps a little bit more in depth now. Back to our spaghetti chart. And I've circled here the different uh, technical stops in the process. So uh, bottom uh, on the le le left side on the, on the uh, left side on the bottom, you, we saw the underwriting review under the financial side. There's also a technical review that's performed at that point. The owner engages an ITPR. Uh, this can be any uh, Texas licensed professional engineer with experience in, in this sort of uh, uh, building uh, type calculations. Uh, moves on through the process. The final projects reviewed, uh, moving over to the right column. The ITPR is engaged again to make sure the project's completed as intended. And then approval certificates are, are issued by the ITPR. So that's the overview. And we're going to dive into each of these a little bit more. So the technical report structure is next. We talked about this, the energy and water analysis, the basis for the project uh, can be done by anyone. It's required uh, to have the, uh, uh, to, to conform to our technical standards. This is a, uh, a document that's published on our website. A contractor engineer can do it. Two key components. So how do we know if these projects are gonna save and, and what's the basis for that? There's, first of all, a, a baseline analysis that's conducted. And so that's looking generally at, you know, 12 months of utility data, uh, normalizing uh, consumption and usage uh, so that uh, you have a good understanding of, of, what, of where, where we're starting with the project. Then projecting off of that, the improvements that are being proposed, uh, what are the expected savings? And so the, the difference is, is the basis for the project, the savings. Uh, we have a, a report format, standard report format. Uh, if there is a cost for doing this, if you have a contractor or engineer or staff, uh, that can be rolled into the project. So the idea with PACE financing is that it can provide 100% financing, so all soft costs as well. Uh, so that, that is something that certainly is eligible and can be rolled into the project cost. Depending on the nature of the project, uh, is it, that's going to determine uh, how in-depth and how detailed this analysis will be. So, so we have sort of two general categories. Uh, one, uh, we call it fast track, and this is really kind of a spreadsheet, a, desk, a desktop type analysis. You're looking at one-to-one uh, -one replacements, uh, distributed generation like solar, where it's uh, fairly straightforward to calculate what the expected energy production from that system will be. Uh, and then the second, a full assessment, uh, this is where you have an existing building with multiple measures that are being addressed at one time, and there are dependencies. So if you replace lighting, for example, 
and the new lighting uh, puts off less heat than the old lighting, then uh, you know there's going to be uh, an impact there to the cooling load and and how you model the the, the need for uh, for cooling for heating. So that's an ASHRAE two uh, type analysis, uh, very commonly done uh, in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning world, and that's what that would be appropriate uh, for use for uh, a more complicated, comprehensive project. We do run into situations where uh, <clears throat> the baseline data is not readily available. And a couple of categories, one, uh, it, either you have a, a vacant building that maybe hasn't had a utility bill or a representative utility bill for some time, or you have a partially vacant building. Uh, and, and that would be, you know, the example here, say you have a hotel, but it hasn't been in use for a while, but it's gonna still be a hotel. So we can look there and we can, we can look at some modeling information, uh, looking at, okay, the existing equipment, the, ex the expected operating hours under normal scenario, and we can model what that baseline would look like. We've also seen uh, a handful of projects that have involved uh, building repositioning. And this is where, say you have a warehouse or a downtown uh, storefront, uh, that, that is, is used for, for a different purpose now. And PACE is being incorporated as part of the financing uh, to address the mechanical systems. Uh, in that case, uh, you may not have, again, good baseline data uh, for, the, for, the, for the building. And so there, you know, what we can look at is assuming the, uh, the well, we, we look at, at the state energy code, which currently is, is called, a, it's the 2015 version of the International Energy Conservation Code. We assume that that is the baseline and that the energy savings would be any improvement over that. So we can calculate that as well. So in these unconventional scenarios, it's a little trickier, uh, but it can be done. It's just uh, a little different process. So uh, those are certainly not off the table. And in many cases, uh, PACE is a perfect match uh, for these sort of uh, repositioning uh, of asset uh, projects. The report template we have, uh, you can see here, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it, 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 a couple of a uh, couple of different sections that are important. An executive summary that just shows the project's uh, overview, then the utility characteristics, the facility overview and baseline, which we just talked about, uh, some detail on the uh, the proposed improvements in section four, and then qualifications of the engineer or whoever has prepared the assessment. And so you're not flying blind there. We have a template to use that uh, has all the different fields that are that are important uh, for qualification of a PACE project. The technical standards that I mentioned, uh, these were uh, developed uh, by a team of folks, mostly volunteers, uh, utility uh, engineers, uh, uh, project financing folks, uh, a, number of, a number of others, and they're based on uh, nationally accepted standards. So it's not anything new or different or that unique. It's just sort of a, a repackaging of a lot of existing standards that are used for this sort of analysis. So any engineer that, again, is probably a mechanical or electrical engineer uh, that, that has done this sort of analysis and work is probably familiar with these. So this is not a stretch for them to, to uh, do this work. The ITPR qualifications at the bottom, uh, we require that that be a Texas licensed PE uh, with uh, energy or water efficiency experience. And we prefer different certifications because that, that demonstrates that they've been involved in these kind of projects. So that's outlined in the technical standards and that's available on our website as well. The program guidelines, which are a step uh, deeper, uh, are also on the website listed here. And as you can see on the screen on the right, uh, the program documents there, uh, you can, you can uh, open up and expand those into uh, the pace in a box, which we call our, our document set and the latest updates, uh, capital provider forms, uh, contract templates, et cetera. It's all there and we have it in English and in Spanish. Uh, so uh, for different trades, uh, that certainly comes in handy, we know, and uh, we en endeavor to have all of our materials in both English and in Spanish. <clears throat> So going through all of those elements, uh, we'll now take a look at the third party review component. And again, this is the important due diligence function. 
So the contractor has done their energy analysis, and now we've moved over to the ITPR. And we call this the before savings review. This is before the, con the project is, is started. Uh, <clears throat> site visit one uh, and the project verification certificate. Uh, this is what an ITPR uh, provides as their documentation. So they review, uh, first of all, they'll certify that meet qualifications that I've just gone through. They don't have, and that they don't have a conflict of interest. Uh, that is what makes them a third party reviewer. They've reviewed the baseline and, and savings uh, projections. They've reviewed the useful life uh, of the of the projected of the project, and they have made a determination in their professional opinion that this is a qualified project under the PACE statute. There are a handful of engineers uh, operating around the state that have done PACE work and serve as ITPRs. Uh, if you're on the webinar today and you are an engineer. Uh, and you're and you're not uh, serving in this capacity yet. We'd certainly be be happy to talk to you more about it. And make sure that uh, uh, you understand how things work and that you can offer your services as an ITPR because we certainly need more of them. It's a big state, and pace projects are really kind of hitting an inflection point and starting to move forward. So we need we need more service providers in the field that can do this sort of work. The qualifications you have again. Uh, Texas PE with experience uh, in this in this sort of building analysis work. Conflict of interest statement uh, has to be an arm's length agreement and the statement uh, there that uh, you're not directly involved in ownership of the project. And that uh, you perform the analysis. This is typically involving a, a initial site visit. Uh, and uh, just to, so you have a, a good understanding of the way the project is starting, you've reviewed the baseline analysis and that you've concluded that the reductions in utility use are reasonable, again, professional judgment there, and that the period of the assessment does not exceed the useful life of the project. So those are the, the components. The uh, ITPR certifies that it's a qualified project under the PACE Act. I don't think I've touched on this yet, but to be eligible also under number one there, this has to be what's considered a permanent improvement fixed to real property. So what does permanent mean? Uh, permanent does not mean uh, forever for 200 years. Permanent means that it remains in place and is permanently affixed uh, for at least the life of the assessment. So examples of things are uh, I generally tell people that if, if it requires uh, a plumber or an electrician to install it, it's probably permanent because it's not transportable. It's not something that's plug and play. It is something that is attached and affixed to the real property. Uh, things that are bolted to the ground, things that require a concrete pad for installation, yes, those, are, those, those meet the permanent uh, uh, definition there. So things that, things, uh, yeah, again, uh, this is not a good example, but a copy machine, a computer that moves around, those are not, those are equipment. That's more like business personal property. And then two, that, that the project's intended to decrease water or energy consumption or demand. Uh, and that's the, the basis of the, the ITPR certification. So the project moves into construction, the construction's completed, and then it moves into the installation verification again by the ITPR. Then they certify again that they're qualified uh, they don't have a conflict, that they performed a site visit, they uh, have verified that the project is completed and operating as intended. Uh, again, that's the, for, the for the protection of the owner, as well as uh, for the capital provider to make sure that everything is, is going to operate uh, the way that's expected. And so that's the, that's the end of the, the technical and third party review. I know it's a lot. And again, happy to uh, you know, take questions, but also talk more offline if you're interested. So resources to help you do this work, we have many of them out there. Uh, the, the best resource is our website. Everything is there. We put it there. Sometimes we put so much information there, it can be challenging to navigate. So uh, some direct links. Um, the program guide and technical standards I referenced earlier are available there. Uh, events and training when we have events, uh, th these are uh, fairly specialized. The ones we're doing this week, these are for the Valley specifically. 
but uh, we have a, a general training that's ongoing. And uh, we also have general events. Uh, I guess post COVID, we'll be doing these in person again. We've gone to all virtual at this point. And then uh, <clears throat> the thing that we're working on too is understanding that uh, going to a location for an in-person training uh, can be uh, can, can be a challenge for your calendar for a time commitment. Uh, we are uh, going to be providing online uh, sort of self-paced contractor training with a, a test, uh, sort of a, a, an assessment at the end to ensure that you understand uh, the content and then uh, a, a sort of a certification and listing uh, for contractors based on, on that testing. We have a number of case studies. We only looked at two today, the plaza in El Paso and the Simon properties, but a number of different case studies that really show how in practice these projects come together. Uh, these are for nonprofits, for, for houses of worship, for multifamily, for manufacturing. Uh, a number of different case studies uh, are there listed on the website, and we're always adding to that. We have, uh, we're a little bit behind. Uh, we, we had uh, in 2020, uh, actually more PACE projects close than in any prior year. And so we're in the process now of, of profiling those and uh, adding those to our case study list. Then also uh, my former office, the Texas State Energy Conservation Office has a PACE funding page that again, uh, sort of uh, at a higher level uh, talks about the mechanics of how PACE works and links to uh, state law enabling it and so forth. We also have recorded, if you go to our resources and education page, which is circled here, I've got this arrow on the bottom left that points to a webinar uh, in, under the technical standards page. Uh, this is a snapshot of everything here. And as you can see, under the educational flyers, uh, we have overviews of PACE uh, for the business community, local governments, commercial, industrial, nonprofit, and English and Spanish again. But then on the webinar side, uh, if you go to that area, I'm going to click through to the next uh, screen. That will bring up uh, this recorded technical standards webinar. And there, are, there are, are five parts that go into even more detail than, than I've gone into today. Uh, you can uh, take these individually. It's, you, can, you can watch the whole thing. Or if you expand uh, those, those bars down on the bottom, you can, it's sectioned off into, into five different areas. So you, look, you can look at one at a time. So uh, a lot of resources on the technical side are available. And again, anything that is, is not answered uh, through these recorded resources, we're happy to help you out with uh, offline one-on-one. -on -one. Something we started last year, and this is again, once, uh, when COVID uh, restricted uh, so much uh, in-person uh, training, uh, which we had done historically, is every uh, third Thursday at two, uh, we call it uh, T5 for TPA's third Thursday at two training. Uh, we are addressing different topics. And uh, starting in April of last year, uh, service providers, uh, part one and two, uh, capital providers in June, looking at utility incentives in July and, and September. Uh, October, uh, a uh, comprehensive uh, training for property owners. We had a, a sort of a, a future, a look around the corner on buildings and transportation in November. And then next week, next Thursday on the 21st, uh, will be our, our first uh, T5 webinar that's focused specifically on industrial and, and large manufacturing projects. How to utilize PACE for that. These are all uh, free to attend. You can register on our training and events uh, webpage. We also record these and the links you see there, uh, which are also on our webpage, uh, are to the recorded YouTube uh, videos on our YouTube channel. So if you miss one uh, or you uh, would like to go back and review it, they're available there. So questions. Uh, as service providers, uh, this does not work without you. Uh, again, our organization, we don't do the retrofit work. We don't do the engineering. We don't do the third party review. We're the facilitator. Uh, so it's really important uh, to engage uh, local contractors and service providers uh, to do this work, and, uh, and we want to help support you uh, in doing that. So I'm going to take, uh, we have a couple of questions that have popped up, and 
I'll take those. And please, if you have an opportunity, you can enter those in the Q&A box now. Uh, the first one is, is, how is the ITPR paid and who is responsible for paying him or her? Uh, the answer to that is the I, ITPR, uh, even though they are independent from the project, they are paid really from the proceeds of the financing. So the owner pays the ITPR uh, and typically the cost for that uh, just get rolled into the, into the pace loan and the financing. And so that becomes uh, part of the project cost. Uh, and so it's the owner that, that pays the I, ITPR. Uh, uh, next question I see is, does the five unit rule that applies for multifamily apply for an office condominium building? Uh, uh, we, we might need to dive into that a little bit more and understand the nature of the building. Uh, I see Charlene is uh, our our president is who's on the line too is typing an answer to that uh, it, it depends on uh, the ownership again for multifamily what we're looking at there is if say you have a uh, a, a a four unit uh, rental uh, uh, property uh, rental income whatever uh, and you own a hundred percent of it but you rent out the four properties that's that really kind of falls cleanly inside the, the, the four unit uh, limit or the under five unit limit uh, yeah. for an office condominium building. Charlene, are you going to, you want to answer yeah. that live or type it in? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, the five unit limit is for multifamily properties. So an office condominium does not share that limit because they're offices, they're not homes. They're not home units. So for an office complex, you can have two units, three units, and still be able to use PACE. Okay, thank you, Charlene. Hopefully that addressed the question. The other thing I wanted to add, if it's okay, is that uh, the ITPR, the ITPRs are often hired by the PACE lenders and the lenders absorb that cost and then, and then fold it into the PACE assessment. So that doesn't have to be a burden uh, or an upfront of expense on behalf of the owner. It's important that the owner or the lender hire the ITPR so they're independent from the contractor, but often uh, the lenders are the ones to, uh, to write that check once they're sure they wanna um, fund the project and that way the owner doesn't have to worry about it. About the extent. Yeah, good clarification. So I'm not seeing any other questions pop up in the Q&A box. Uh, that's my email at the top here. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to send any uh, direct questions or inquiries to me. And uh, Rick, I believe you're still on, aren't you? I'm, I'm on. Actually, I have a I have a question for you. Actually, sure. Yeah. Um, Babe, I'll. Would any so say a construction project begins or whatever? Do the prevailing wage requirements apply to any of these projects that are being uh, funded through this this particular program? The, no, and uh, even though uh, well, so prevailing wage requirements typically apply to uh, projects that are uh, uh, supported with public funds, uh, right? The funding that uh, supports PACE projects is private funding, so different okay. individual capital providers and, and banks. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Davis-Bacon requirements and prevailing wage for laborers typically uh, don't apply since these are uh, private buildings, private transactions, and, and, and private financing. Okay. All right. Good to know. Uh, my last question, and this, I meant to ask you this way back, but I didn't want to interrupt the flow. Based on what the slide indicated and that kind of thing. I'm assuming any kind of leasehold improvement to a particular building would apply. I mean, not any, but just based on the description that you provided earlier. If it's a leasehold improvement, um, as long as the owner of the facility is okay with that, how, how would that work? I mean, I guess well, let me cut to the chase here. I'm renting, I'm a long-term renter in a, in a commercial facility. And I'm looking to cut down my utility expenses. It's that kind of a lease where I, I'm on I'm on the hook for utilities here, and I'm looking for a way to reduce these. Would I have to work with the landlord and make sure they're okay with that because it's technically a leasehold improvement? Yeah, the the owner and like a, a triple net lease uh, situation, uh, the owner 
uh, of record for the property is the one that would need to initiate the project and the PACE loan and the structure for the PACE improvement. Uh, so it would be the owner that, do, that does that. Now, typically what happens, and this is the case like in malls, a similar situation, uh, the cost of the, of the repayments for the PACE project uh, become an operating cost that your lease probably uh, provides a pass-through component. So you, the owner, are going to, or you, the, you, the tenant, are going to uh, see lower utility bills, and uh, the the uh, that that will you, you'll see a component of the of the of the pace repayment pass through an operating cost, but that'll be offset through lower utility bills. So it's got to be done, and the, the owner has to initiate the project. Uh, but you will benefit uh, if you're paying the utilities. I'm not sure if I answered that clearly or not, but ho hopefully. <laughs> Rick, for me, your audio is breaking up a little bit, uh, but but yeah, I think I mean the, the the nature of this is that it's the landlord, the owner of the property that needs to initiate the improvement. Uh, oftentimes, the tenants, uh, you know, as as uh, the occupants of the spaces, that you know, uh, you're going to be more aware of needs, whether it's you know, uh, lighting improvement, base conditioning, moisture, humidity control, things like that, improvements to the building that can enhance your operations or make the building more useful. And so approaching the, the landlord and say, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not asking you to necessarily pay for this out of pocket, but we can use the PACE mechanism in a way that uh, provides uh, financing offset by the savings in a way that doesn't uh, uh, I guess negatively impact your your bottom line. Uh, so it's more of a, it would you would you would definitely need to be be in coordination initiated by the owner. But I think uh, tenants uh, are going to be key in in helping uh, drive that conversation. Great, thanks. Thank I think there's another question. Okay. And Deb, while you're looking at that, I also want to um, suggest that we've seen a couple situations in other states where the tenant has a good long-term relationship with the landlord. Right. If the tenant is willing to say, look, let's um, amend the lease uh, to clarify that you can pass that payment through to us, we'll pay it. Um, and the landlord knows that the tenant's gonna be there to do that, uh, then that uh, landlord tenant relationship can facilitate getting the landlord comfortable to do a PACE assessment. Yep. The, uh, another question that popped up here, and I think Charlene, this falls into the, the bucket you were addressing is, uh, does the four unit limit apply when the property is a hotel type operation? So um, I think we had a similar question earlier this week. Uh, if the property is considered a hotel, uh, or uh, something like that, then it's possible you can use PACE. If it is defined as a residential property with four units, it will be one unit short. So that's a legal question. It's gonna be a fact-based question. It might be different for different buildings. Um, and that's something uh, that we would certainly be willing to look into. Thanks, thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. We appreciate everyone's time this morning. Again, uh, you have my email there at the top. And uh, Rick, you know how to find him. Rick, any any closing comments today? Just want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, really, really informative. We're here to see you know, how, how, how we can. Yeah, you guys know how to find us there. It's a little over than about the council. Um, and then let's see what happens. Let's uh, uh, let you guys make some sessions move forward and we'll take it from there. there. All right. Th thank you all for being with us this morning and uh, expect uh, an email uh, after this with, uh, with links uh, to the slides and so forth. So you'll have this as a resource going forward. And again, appreciate your time and we look forward to working with you and, and rolling out even uh, uh, pace uh, region wide in the valley and pursuing lots of great projects.
have a have a good rest of your day. Well, folks, have a great day.